All right. <coughs> Let's see how this goes. Are we live? Is there anybody out there? And we're waiting. And we're waiting. Hello. <laughs> All right. I think we're getting going. How's everybody doing today? We'll give it a couple of more minutes and uh, maybe not minutes, but uh, we'll give it a couple of more time and then we'll get going. <laughs> hey, Carol, how are you? Good afternoon, Debbie. Marilyn, how you doing? Hey, Bobby Joe. Good afternoon, Steve. Hey, Beth. How you doing, Suzanne? Hey, Jean. It's chilly here in Texas, too. It's like 80 degrees outside right now. I uh, I didn't quite know what to make of it. Um, I didn't want to die as soon as I stepped outside. It was fantastic. Um, hi, Priscilla. All right, so clearly I am not Pastor Borkhart. Uh, I'm Pastor Goodman. I'm, I'm jumping in for uh, for Pastor Borkhart, who, uh, who who's not feeling so well and whose family is also struggling uh, with COVID. We ask that you would continue to to keep them in your prayers. Uh, we we especially want to remember um, Sophia and uh, that that the Lord would spare her from this. Uh, so far, though. Um, they're they're doing they're they're hanging in there. Uh, I talked to Pastor Borghart yesterday for just a little bit, and uh, they're they're doing well. But we're just going to kind of give them some time to tend to their own. Um, hey, Bishop, how you doing? So um, as I see it, um, and, and uh, yell at me or type in all caps lock if I'm wrong. Uh, do I have a flow chart? Boy, do I ever! Do I have ADHD today? Why, yes, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> Um, as I understand it, and, and type in all caps if I'm wrong, Pastor Borghart left me at uh, Genesis chapter 49, verses 18, um, which is where we'll be picking up today. I didn't turn on my furnace. I drove to work with my windows down, though. Um, it, it's fantastic. I'm, I've only been in Texas for a year now, uh, but I'm still kind of getting used to the fact that uh, we do things backwards here um, but because it's Texas we say that everybody else is doing it backwards and we are right uh, but but really um, right now is the time that everybody starts coming outside so um, we, we think about uh, putting things away for the winter months uh, for for Texas, uh, at least down here in San Antonio, everybody puts everything away for the summer, and we don't go outside any more than we absolutely have to. Um, it, it's the the winter uh, that, that actually brings us outside. Um, and I say us, like I am both a Midwesterner still and a Texan. I don't know what I am. So let's just go with baptized. Uh, we're going to jump in. Uh, Genesis chapter 49, verses 18. Um, I've got up on the screen a, a verse ahead to, to kind of remind us what's going on right now. Um, Jacob, Israel, is, uh, is getting ready to die. And so he's called his, his sons to him, and he is, he is blessing them. Um, and, and it's been kind of a trip so far, but just all of a sudden, in verse 18, he just stops. So, I, I, I mean, we, we have um, just going through blessing, 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 blessing. Time out. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. And here we get going. And then he'll jump right back into blessings. Um, and so it's the I wait for your salvation that I kind of want to look at because the other side of it is something that uh, I don't understand. Maybe Pastor Borkhardt did. Um, but there, there are all of these prophecies that we just sort of squint at, um, like we're, when we're, we're looking at clouds and trying to make out the pictures that they might be. Um, and this is the, the, one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit as we get to, um, to some of these prophecies is that... Um, there's a, a bit of a danger in trying too hard to tie it to any one thing in particular um, because it, it's 
up for a lot of debate, up for a lot of interpretation. And if you can't actually say, thus saith the Lord, then the book that is all about the Lord thus saying, uh, it's it sort of robbed of a lot of the great uh, certainty that you have inside of this. And remember, the scriptures were given that we would have certainty. These things were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and by believing you may have life in his name. This is at the end of the Gospel of John. But um, even as the Gospel of John sort of parrots the beginning of, of Genesis, uh, we can also take that the book of Genesis was written that we would believe that there would be a Christ. All the way from chapter 1, um, we, we can actually start to look for the same triune God in the book of Genesis as we can in the, the Gospel of John, which I hear might maybe even be next. Um, and if that's the case, we want to be careful with the prophecy. Um, it, it's good to look at it, and it's even good to look at all the things that it might be. But we, we also don't want to get too hung up on it. So this verse 18, this just sort of break in the middle of, of uh, Jacob blessing all of his sons, is a wonderful thing. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. And it's a theme throughout the scriptures. Um, we'll, we'll dive into my ADHD here uh, just a, a little bit um, and go with that. But uh, we'll, we'll jump to a couple of these other things. Um, Let's go to Psalm 62, verse 1. Uh, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. So even as, as Jacob is, is blessing his sons, um, he's waiting for something more. Um, he, he's waiting for something more because more was, was actually promised. I wait for your salvation, O Yahweh, O Lord, O God of gods. Um, Isaiah 25. Um, I, I want to go to this. Um, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a, ri a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. In both cases, you see David um, praying the very same uh, prayer as Jacob. We see uh, the prophet Isaiah uh, echoing these words. Um, inside of all of this, what you have is, uh, well, the one holy Catholic lowercase c faith. The, the same faith in the same promised Messiah. Um, what we're looking for here then is more than just um, we will have a, a mighty worldly nation in this place. It, it's more than just uh, our, our, our children will be very wealthy and successful. Uh, it, it's, it's more than just we will not have pains or problems. Isaiah actually starts to give it depth. He starts to, to shape uh, the, the prayer just a little bit more. He adds uh, the color behind it. Uh, the veil cast over all nations, the very veil that Jacob is actually right now drawing over himself or watching drawn over himself is death. Jacob's getting ready to die. But even while he's getting ready to die, he calls out to the Lord and says, Lord, you're going to undo death itself. All of this stuff that I'm blessing my children with, it has to do with the faith. All of these blessings, they are not independent of the faith. They are not separate from the faith. This is not an aside. This is a part of the same thing. This, this little verse rooted in the middle of all of these other blessings that, that are put here. Um, that's all tiny. That's not helpful to you at all. Let's make it bigger. Um, Right here in, in Genesis 18, um, I wait for your salvation, O Lord, in the middle of all of these other blessings. Um, what, what you have is the tie between everything that's going on that is a little unclear and the one thing you can actually be certain about. When we wait for the Lord, uh, we wait for the Lord who conquers death. We wait for the Lord who conquers death, even then through his own death and resurrection. We're waiting for our own resurrection because Jesus died and rose for us. The salvation that we're talking about is not earthly wealth. It's the only kind of salvation that there's ever been. Jeremiah echoes it too. Um, Lamentations 3.26 It is good that one should wait quietly, not for the Lord, for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Um, the Lord that doesn't bring salvation is not the Lord. Like, it's just not. Yours is the Lord of salvation for you. 
the, the God who is disconnected from saving his people is the God who is disconnected from the gospel. The God who is disconnected from the gospel is the God who is disconnected from the cross. The God who is disconnected from the empty tomb is not the God of all. It, it, it's a false God. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. This means then that when we start to talk about what we wait for in the Lord, um, we, we, talk about, uh, we talk about the promises of God sometimes as... Um, we talk about the promises of God sometimes as if we think he's doing a really bad job at, at the things that he's supposed to be doing, but heaven will just somehow make all of that right. It is good that one should wait, not just for the Lord. Like, I want a pony, God, so get me a pony right now. And if you're not going to get me a pony, you're not actually God. Well, no, that's, that's not the thing that's been promised to you. I'm sorry if you want a pony, um, but the Lord has promised you salvation. And so as we wait, we wait not just sort of for a, a general God, but we wait for a specific God who has made specific promises. And even back uh, before all of the, the lines were necessarily colored, and even as he spoke to Abraham, uh, he, he spoke uh, of uh, a, a nation that would be more numerous than the stars in the sky, more numerous than the grains of sand on the earth. This is the same promise that is fulfilled in Jesus. But that also means then the expectations that Abraham should have of his God should be tied to that specific promise, and they were. They were so much so that uh, we, we talked about this as, as Abraham took his, his only son, Isaac, who is now laying down to die up on the mountain um, to sacrifice him. He, he looked right back at the servants who were with him and said, yeah, I don't know how this is going to work, but we're going to see you again. There, there's whatever happens between death and resurrection. I, I'm not going to try and explain, but I know. I know that he's the one, and so through him will come the people, and so we are coming back down this mountain. This specific promise of resurrection is what uh, Abraham waited for. It's what Isaac is still waiting for. Um, we, when we wait, not just quietly um, for a generic God with generic promises, but with a God who makes specific promises, then all of a sudden we, we look to Jesus. Um, as for me, I will look to the Lord. I wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. This is a certainty from the prophet Micah. Um, again, recognizing that if yours is the God of salvation, well, when was your salvation worked? It, it, it was worked it, um, by Ephesians before the very foundation of the world. Before God ever spoke in Genesis and said, let there be light, the lamb was slain, says the book of Revelation. Uh, as, as this was played out in time for, for us, um, we look back to the cross of Christ. Um, but is there a blurry screen? Anything that makes my face less distinct is usually helpful for me. I, it's because of the funny looking. Um, we wait for a God who gives absolute certainty. But even Micah, before, before the Christ was, was incarnate, before the Christ was crucified and raised, was certain. He was waiting for the salvation, certain that his God would hear him because yours is a God who keeps his promises. And this is finally something that, that we'll start to look at um, in the book of Romans. We're going to go to Romans 18 and, and read through 25. Um, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself would be set free from bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Um, yeah, maybe my internet's just sort of wrestling with uh, what we're trying to do here. Um, talk to the senior pastor about staying off YouTube while I'm doing this. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So in Romans, we still have a, a waiting for the salvation of the Lord. We, we also have a waiting that, that is dealing with the, the veil that is cast over all nations, even still. And it's 
it's almost harder in the New Testament after Christ is risen from the dead because we want to just sort of rise with him right now today and not have to worry about the whole also being united to him in his death and our baptism. Uh, and, and so we look around and we see everything's awful down here. It's 2020. And all, all the while, though, uh, we are still waiting for the, the glory uh, to be revealed to us. We are waiting for the own resurrection. We are, re we are waiting for the, the creation to be set free from bondage, to, to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. But we wait for it with patience. And we do so, um, we do so because we look back. See, um, the, the, the thing that actually lets us wait with, with um, any kind of certainty, that, that lets us speak like Isaac and say, I wait for your salvation, O Lord, as an absolute and not a maybe, it is not by looking sort of forward to the things we can't quite understand. Um, and it's usually also not looking to the now, because the now is full of all kinds of uncertainty too. Um, most of the things I'm certain about are bad things. It's by looking back, looking back to the things your God has already done. And so for us, we look back to the cross of Christ where your salvation was won. So that as we deal in our present, I can say of all the things I don't understand in this world, of all the things that threaten, and of all the things that destroy, my God already has worked this salvation. And if I want to find him working here and now, I start to look for the things that tie me back to that cross so that I can be carried forward to the resurrection. I want to look to baptism. I want to look to the means of grace. Baptism ties you back to the cross. For Romans says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were united with him through baptism into death so that we'd also be united with him in resurrection. See, if we want to be any, any kind of certain about what's coming, we have to be certain about what was. Yours is the God who already won your salvation back then. The mirroring, it's forward. Back then. So that as we go forward, well, it's Hebrew. We can start this side and work other way. Um, back then, we, we can actually be, be sure uh, of what's going on. Um, inside of all of this, uh, what we're looking to is, is, is back. A and um, e even, even now in the Old Testament, it's the same thing. Um, as Jacob lies there dying, um, he looks back to the promises made to Abraham so that he would have any kind of certainty at all in this thing. He, he looks backwards to the promises that, that were made um, to, to his father, so that um, having watched Abraham being led through all of these things, I mean, honestly, even just probably remembering all too clearly uh, laying on an altar uh, with a knife, kind of yay too close, uh, he remembers the God who delivers sinners. And so he can look forward then as he speaks to his sons, which is good. Uh, because, well, I imagine this is probably at least a little bit of a trying time for them, uh, losing their father. Uh, I, I imagine their wits maybe aren't entirely about them uh, as they face the last great enemy for somebody for whom they love, and that's allowed. That's actually where God's word should be entering in. When, when we are faced with that last great enemy, death, this is a time more so to fall back on the clear promises of God. Uh, and, and so the blessings that are being poured out, like recognize that there's probably at least a little bit confusing to them. Like you hear your name, I, I, I don't know. Um, so so we'll, we'll go forward a verse. Like my name's Gad and raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. And I'm like, thanks dad. Don't know what that means. I'm not sure about, not the first part. It'd be better to be Asher. He just gets food. Can I get some? Uh, can I get some of that? Um, Naphtali is a doe let loose. Uh, the bear's beautiful fawns. There's some translation stuff we'll get to with that. Uh, but but in all of it, it's it's nondescript. So Jacob reminds them about what it all points to. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Jacob reminds them what all of these things are pointing to. This is the same God who took care of my father, who took care of me, who takes care of you. Uh, Jacob sees the promise by by um, looking back to Abraham. Um, so as he's blessing his kids, you can kind of look at um, you can kind of look at it in two ways. Um, first, I, I would say he probably wants more for his kids than just for them to be sort of successful and happy. Um, it's not that any parent doesn't want their kids to be successful and happy, but at least as Christians, the thing that we are called to care for more than anything else for our children is is that they be faithful. The Bible doesn't actually tell you to raise happy children. It tells you to raise faithful ones. The Bible also doesn't tell you to, to raise children who are successful by any means necessary. 
It tells you to raise them faithful. And it ties the promises to the faith. And so it's not that I want my children to be unhappy most of the time. Um, it's, It's that I recognize that sometimes the things that make them happy aren't good for them. But also sometimes the things that that are good for their faith, those are the things that I should pray for. Um, And and that doesn't mean just sort of like whip them into the faith because nobody's ever actually whipped into the faith. Faith comes not from berating your children to go to church more and lecturing them. Faith comes from the hearing of the word, the word of Christ. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but I'm sure that if I bother my kids enough, I can make them do it. No, Uh, it's the Holy Spirit who calls by the gospel, enlightens with his gifts, sanctifies and keeps me in the one true faith. And in the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, sanctifies and keeps the whole Christian church on earth with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. Um, All of this comes from uh, wanting to expose our children to God's true word, his gospel, that they would not simply be beaten into the faith. I mean, this is actually one of the big, wonderful things I've seen uh, when when I started to get involved with higher things is we actually actually give the gospel to the kids. Uh, That that youth group can be something more than, hey kids, Jesus loves you, so stay in school and listen to your parents and don't do drugs and don't have sex because Jesus loves you and that's the whole of your religion. Just don't do those things because Jesus loves you. But there's such a a mingling of law and gospel that you end up losing the gospel entirely and the only thing you really have left is a whole bunch of kids who want to keep their their parents, uh, or I mean a whole bunch of parents who want to keep their their kids both safe and, and successful and happy and they recognize the pitfalls of so many things but the religion has to be more than just a club to try and steer them in the right way. Jacob calls out I wait for your salvation, O Lord. And he wants it for his kids too. He wants his kids redeemed. All of the blessings, whether or not they're, they're distinct or, or indistinct, um, have to be tied to that. He, he wants redemption. Um, there's, there's something I kind of wondered, and, and I don't know. Um, so since I don't know, clearly I'll talk about it. Did... Um, did Jacob look into the future and see these things that he blessed his, his sons with um, and then God backed him up? Or, or was he just carried along? And, and um, in other words, did God tell him, this is what you say about Gad and then I'll do it? Or did God say, look, you, you speak and I'll, I'll back it up. I'll, I've got it. I'll take care of you. Don't worry. Let's go to Matthew sixteen nineteen. I don't know if it's this or not. But um, our Lord to the church um, speaks to Peter and says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Our Lord actually sends people to speak words that he will back up with all power and authority, so that when you hear the words, um, in this stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's not that your pastor can look forward and say, yeah, you're into heaven, so I guess I can say this to you. I, I, I saw forward in time that you won't be saved, so I'm definitely not absolving you of that. Or is it that God actually wants everybody forgiven? And so he sends people out with potent words and then backs them up himself with all the power in heaven and says, Go and preach mercy to those sinners. Forgive them their sins, and I will forgive them in heaven. And if anybody would be uh, resolute about his unbelief, retain them that he would know the truth, that, that heaven is closed to him. But in all of it, speak with an authority that I will back up. Um, God actually, uh, I, I, I kind of think, is backing up the words of uh, Isaac, acting as a, a preacher to his kids. As, as he's blessing these things, God's like, yep, I guess I'm going to have to work with that one now, but I'm going to use this for good, which we'll get to unless Pastor Borkhart gets back. Um, I think that probably he can catch glimpses of it, of what's coming. Like, he, he sees the dangers of living among a whole bunch of other unbelievers with the Egyptians. And, and he also, you know, sees past the wealth of, of, of this day. And so he can see both of these things because at this time as he's dying, remember, um, because of Joseph, uh, his family is, is well cared for. They're in the best land. They, they have to not worry about the famine. Everything's okay. But they're also now surrounded by people who don't believe like them. And, and he, he got to recognize that, uh, that that might just maybe, maybe be a detriment to the, the faithfulness of, of this coming generation. Um, I don't know, sort of like today, when we have raised a, a group of children who are now adults, uh, who have wanted for less than any other 
group of children raised into adults have in the history of mankind. Um, honestly, like like even even a, a, a lower middle class, even a poor person in America w was raised uh, to want for less than most people in all of history throughout all of time, uh, no matter how wealthy they might be. And well, we, we've also watched them raised uh, in communities of unbelievers. And how's that gone? So again, we, we go back to uh, to verse 18. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Jacob sees only the promised savior that's it there's a luther quote i'm going to give you um whoop, i'm hiding some of it there we go get my face out of the way it shouldn't be there all right therefore the words i wait for thou salvation o lord are words of faith even in these physical matters which cannot be asked for or accepted expected from god unless we conclude with a sure faith that god cares for us is favorably disposed forgives us our sins and wants to be present in all dangers and necessities, not only to those that are spiritual, but also those that are physical, because they're tied together. For in this way, Jacob strengthens both his tribe of Dan and all the rest of the tribes. Be not afraid. God will not forsake you. As stated in the psalm, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Luther, um, smart dude. Um, he, he says, in all of these things, this is a matter of faith first and foremost. For God to, to uh, for, I mean, for Jacob to speak this way in any capacity at all, first he actually has to believe that God is a good God. And that, that if you know who your God is, we talked about this last time I was with you, if you know who your God is, the what becomes a lot easier to deal with. We always want to deal with God according to what and how, what is going on right now and how do I fix it? But this is a question of who. Who is, your, who is your God? Who is the Lord? He's the, the Lord of salvation for you. That makes the blessings different. Let's go then to squinting at prophecy. Uh, because if we're going to be honest, I have no idea what most of this stuff means. And if you read a whole bunch of commentaries, nobody has any real idea of what this stuff means. I'll give you one more Luther quote uh, to, before we, we start doing this. Let's see. Uh, where is it? Ooh, 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 right there. Uh, the words of the patriarch Jacob are altogether obscure. Virtually no one understands them. That means I'm going to definitely be able to make sense of it for y'all. It's going to go bad. Um, the problem when the words are kind of indistinct, uh, indistinct uh, where there are many ways, there is no good way. Um, if, if this can mean anything, then it means nothing. I'm not saying the, these prophecies that, that um, our, our Lord is making um, through Jacob to his children don't matter. I'm saying that if we want to leave it wholly up to every single person's individual interpretation and just sort of say, what does this mean to you? Um, nothing good is necessarily going to come to it. Uh, what does the Bible mean to you is a stupid question. I don't know who told you there are no such thing as stupid questions, but there are stupid questions. Sometimes they get asked in confirmation. They always get asked in confirmation. Um, but have you noticed that the catechism isn't, what does this mean to you? The catechism first gives us the right question so that we would hear the right answer. There's a reason that we, we, we deal with stupid questions in confirmation. We give them the catechism, which teaches them first the right questions to ask. Inside of the catechism, if you don't learn anything, learn this. If you ask the wrong question, you'll never get the right answer. So ask the right question first, and you'll get the right answer. I had a seminary professor, uh, Dr. Misaki, always... Uh, said this to us and it drove us nuts but uh, when we would ask him something we always thought was really insightful he would look at us and he would say wrong question and I used to think it was just him trying to get out of it, having to answer it um, but but in reality um, the wrong questions are the wrong questions um, if, if they take away from Jesus the, the wrong questions are um, the wrong questions if they don't actually point to a, a clear Messiah um, a, a crucified and risen Lord for you and so we'll dive into some of these prophecies, but let's let's sort of do so in light of the fact that we are at least a little bit squinting and trying to make out the shape of it all the way through. Fair enough. All right. So Gad, forty nine nineteen. Boy, I hid in that last verse a long time because I don't want to do this, huh? Okay, uh, that's not for me. That's for somebody else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. All right, so I mean, this could possibly, possibly be uh, fulfilled in uh, Joshua uh, chapter 4, um, where Joshua is sending people of this tribe uh, 
throughout the land, um, especially as they, they begin to sort of set up for uh, the wall of Jericho. So we can go to Joshua 4.12 and, and uh, see that one period, not two. Uh, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over ar um, armed people, or passed over armed before the people of Israel, as Moses told them. Uh, they were ready then for battle uh, for Jericho. Um, it, it maybe is that, I don't know. Um, it, it might even just be that um, the, the tribe of Gad uh, was on the borders of, of Israel here. Um, and, and so they, they got attacked a, a, a lot. Um, whoop, that's, look, they're, they're all over here by the corner. You can't see my mouse. That they, they, uh, it, you, you see it. It's the big word that says Gad. It's the same as a Bible verse. Um, it, so, so maybe it's just that, you know, um, there were actual raiders that would be there a, a lot, um, and they would sort of have to get used to that. Um, it might even maybe, maybe be like a, a Elijah the Tishbite, who may have belonged to the tribe of Gad, who dwelt in the land of Gilead, um, who with Jehu in First Kings, uh, we're, we're told, will lay waste to those who assault Israel. Uh, those who escape um, Elijah shall Jehu deal with. You, you know that verse. Um, I don't know. But that actually gives us a chance to kind of fall back then onto the things that that we do know. Not that, that's an error. Let's go this, Psalm 94, beginning at verse 21. They band together against the life of the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God the rock of my refuge. He will bring back on them their iniquity and wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord God will wipe them out. So you see the band coming together against the righteous one to condemn the innocent man to death. Uh, you see the, uh, the passion of our, our Lord. Um, the, these are not whole armies in the traditional sense. They're, they're small bands of soldier thieves. A, a raider is somebody who's both a soldier and a, a thief. To, to raid, you actually want to take something back with you. Um, and so then watch this verse uh, in light of the passion of our Lord. I don't know if it's this, but it sounds like Jesus. And I like Jesus. The raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. So the devil attacks our Lord. Um, but then the Lord raids back. The Lord is the warrior thief who raids the very hell, uh, the, the very gates of hell. Yeah, the, the Lord is the warrior thief who, uh, on the, the, the vigil of, of the, the resurrection, kicks in the gates of hell uh, and, and preaches to the soul's therein. Uh, ours is the God who, who, who kicks open the doors of death and lets us live. The devil tried to claim us in the fall. He, he did so sneakily. He, he snuck in and, and he fought and, and, and scratched and clawed and stole from the Lord's creation. But the Lord calls, uh, the Lord raids back. He, he, he comes in, uh, not with a, a great army, but he sends forth the innocent one to bear the cross. But in doing so, uh, we are, are, are one and even, even stolen back from the kingdom of, of the devil. We are, we are God's own gift. Um, I don't know. I would rather, though, in all of these, when, when we deal with sort of just the fact that we sort of have to squint at the prophecy, recognize then that um, it might maybe be talking about Joshua and it might maybe be talking about Elijah, uh, but all of the scriptures testify to Christ. And so there, um, you should, you should be looking for Jesus. Um, and, and there you should be rejoicing that, that um, as God gives this gift that is uh, through Jacob tied to waiting for salvation, it would be a, an, an apt time to talk about the place where God won salvation. I'm just putting that out there. We'll do Asher. Uh, Asher, uh, Asher's food shall be rich and he shall yield royal delicacies. So dibs on being Asher, because I just want to eat all day. Um, Luther called it a Bethlehem, not the Bethlehem. Um, it, it's a house of bread, Bethlehem. So, so when, uh, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem and laid in a feeding trough, we, we know then that, that um, this is even foreshadowing. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a call to see communion, that, that uh, we would eat the Lord's body feeding trough in, in, in the bread that he ties himself to. Um, Asher will live in a house of bread, not, not the Bethlehem, that's, that's in a different place. Uh, but just sort of the reality is, um, where'd you go, Asher's right there on the sea, uh, right there on the, the northern part of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, good land there, lots of good food. Um, nothing terribly exciting, but uh, at the same time, uh, 
cool stuff. Naphtali. Naphtali is a doe let loose that bears beautiful fawns. Um, I, I, again, uh, Luther had no idea what this meant. Um, and we kind of talked about this. Um, if you don't actually know what it means, first you're allowed to say, I don't, I don't know entirely what this means. Uh, the, the English here isn't maybe the best translation though. Uh, Naphtali is a doe let loose uh, that bears beautiful fawns. Um, it, it might mean uh, beautiful words bears beautiful words in the Hebrew, or um, beautiful offspring, or, or, or a beautiful harvest in the, the Greek, the Septuagint. Um, so, so again, we, we can kind of take this and say, all right, so these beautiful words uh, that, that came uh, from Naphtali the doe let loose. Maybe this is the song of, of Deborah to Abinoam uh, of Naphtali, uh, who, who collected an army against Sisera. Um, maybe. There's this, this maybe thing that bothers me, though. Like, the, the words of our Lord were not given to you that you would ever say maybe. The words of the Lord were given to you that you would say, I know that my Redeemer lives. The words of the Lord were given to you that, that you would uh, hear of Jesus. And so there, there, are, there are sometimes both smaller and larger fulfillments of these prophecy. And so in the same way that the temple was torn down and rebuilt, um, we, we can say, yes, uh, there, there, there was an actual occupation of the temple. Uh, but in the same time, the temple that was torn down and rebuilt in three days was Jesus. Uh, the, the destruction of the temple happened on the cross long before the actual bricks were, were torn apart. God in his mercy works both. It is God who fulfilled both the minor things and the major things. So it is God then who, who worked um, through the song of Deborah. Um, it is God who, who worked through Joshua. It is God who worked through uh, Elijah and, and Jehu. And it's the same God then who ultimately finds all of these things driving towards Christ who bore the cross for us. Uh, so, so go with this then. Uh, let's go Isaiah again. Um, I'm going to go to Isaiah 26 and, and grab 16 and, and forward. Uh, o Lord, in distress they sought you. They poured out a whispered prayer when, you dis when your discipline was upon them. Like a pregnant woman who writhes and cries out in her pangs when she is near to giving birth, so were we because of you, O Lord. We were pregnant. We writhed. But we have given birth to wind. We have accomplished no deliverance on earth. And the inhabitants of the world have not fallen. Your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light. And the earth will give her birth to the dead. I like this. Again, here's the, the verse that we're looking at. Naphtali is a doe let loose that bears beautiful words in the Hebrew. So they pour out beautiful prayers, whispered prayers of those in the pains of childbirth in Romans 8 that we just looked at. Remember the pains of childbirth that, that take um, all of creation? Well, the, the beautiful prayer is, is that they would, they would escape death. The, the, the beautiful prayer, the, the beautiful words, um, it is a promise of resurrection, even while so much else is falling apart. Uh, we are loosed from death. It's, it's a wonderful thing. I, I, in all of it, uh, it's the same death and resurrection of Jesus, though. Um, you, you can get sort of as lost in the weeds in these things as you want to get, or, or you can look for the Lord. But, but as for me and mine, um, I'm a dummy, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about Jesus. The history is good. Uh, I, I'm not trying to, to denigrate that. Um, but at the same time, even that history uh, was pointing to something more. So let's keep going. Joseph, uh, I'm going to read a couple verses here. Here we go. Uh, Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely. Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the mighty hand, by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. They even capitalized it for you. That was kind of them. Gave you the wink and the nod there. Uh, by the God of your Father who will help you, by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings from heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessing of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your Father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents, up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who is set apart from his brothers. In case you thought we were only going to do like three verses today, there. 
let's do Joseph. Joseph is promised to be fruitful. Um, the, the Greek and the Hebrew actually um, don't talk about it as in uh, terms of, of plants, um, but but it's a son and daughters. Um, and so um, a son growing like a fountain, the daughters that run over the wall. Um, in all of this, what we recognize is uh, Joseph will, will actually be the one who gets two tribes. Uh, his children, Ephraim and Manasseh, will, will both be uh, large tribes in the area. Right there in the middle is Manasseh, Ephraim right below it. Um, there, there is a, a promise um, of blessings from heavens, below the, heavens above the depths below blessings of, of fertility, um, blessings uh, up to the desire of, of the hills of the world um, in, in the original. Um, so, so that as we, we, we see this, um, we, we have a, a, a Lord who has promised to be, be faithful to, to Joseph um, and, and to reward him. And you see this is as sort of a, a concrete playing out of the, the very resurrection of the body and the life everlasting that our Lord will give us. Uh, the, these little blessings that are tied in, again, are not to be disregarded. It's not that it's an insignificant thing that, that um, Joseph's tribes were, were in good land. This foreshadows, this, this points to the resurrection of the body. Uh, in the Old Testament, you have that which is um, happening. It's always very concrete to that which is in the New Testament spiritual. And so in the Old Testament, when God's wrath was on, upon somebody, they died in fire. And in the New Testament, when God's wrath is heavy upon somebody, uh, we look around and we're like, okay, what's going to happen? Um, but we don't see it. The Old Testament was given so that we can actually see that it's a real thing. The wrath of God is a real thing. The blessings of God are real things. And that's important to remember, especially in times like these where we say, well, Lord, I, I prayed, I'm faithful, but I'm, I'm wrestling with COVID. Lord, I prayed, I'm faithful, but I'm, I'm broke. I'm, I'm going through uh, an awful divorce. Lord, have mercy upon me. Everything is, is ruined. Where are these promises that you talked about? Uh, because in the Old Testament, when you, when you took care of people, they just, they had stuff. Um, and, and our Lord would say, it's not that I've forsaken you. It's not that I've forgotten you. It's that all of these things are driving towards something more. Because even then, um, the, the, the great tribes of, of Manasseh and Ephraim, well, they don't call them that anymore on the map, do they? Um, this part of the world, super peaceful place to live right now? Oh, yeah? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, maybe there's something more. All of these things um, are, are pointing towards, again, a, a larger blessing. Uh, and here we, we can start to, to carry this um, as they recognize uh, the archers bitterly attacked Joseph, shot at him, harassed him severely. Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hand of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Um, possibly again, Ahab was killed by a Syrian arrow uh, in First Kings. Um, but I want to go to Psalm 38 because again, I like looking for Jesus. I'm going to read this whole thing because. We, we don't have time, but I'm going to make us have time. This is, this is freebie. Um, <laughs> o Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down upon me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day long I go about mourning, for my sides are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O oh Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes that is also gone from me. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague, and my nearest kin stand socially distanced. Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man and I do not hear, like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, hey, this sounds familiar, do I wait? It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. For I said, only let them not rejoice over me who boast against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. My foes are vigorous. They are mighty. And many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me. Again, sounds familiar. O Lord of my salvation. The arrows that were heavy upon the psalmist... Were not bad guys' arrows. They were the Lord's arrows. 
the the Lord sent those arrows. That that hurt. It's a chance to actually wrestle with the, the idea that um, maybe just everything in the world that hurts you uh, must not necessarily be of the devil, and everything in the world that makes you feel good must not necessarily be of God. The, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, we're building towards something here in, in uh, this next chapter. Uh, maybe even, even those arrows sent David's way, maybe even Joseph's way, um, were sent by the Lord. But what's wonderful is that David, even though he is uh, attacked by the Lord's arrows, um, he, he is crushed by the Lord's law, which points out his sin. He waits for the Lord's salvation. He trusts not in the what is happening right now or the what, has, uh, what, what I can do in the middle of all of this according to the law, but in the character and nature and promises of God. Yours is the God of salvation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of David, is the God who died on the cross for you and rose from the dead. He sends forth a word that kills and a word that makes alive. God works all of these things for your good because he actually wants to bring about the one thing that, that Jacob's waiting for all the way along. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wrong one. There it is. Uh, I ruined it. I ruined the big reveal. I'm so awkward. I wait for your salvation, O oh Lord. Uh, in all of it, um, our, our, our Lord gives us, even in the middle of these blessings, uh, a constant call back to, uh, a chance to wait for his salvation. Uh, we wait for those things that we do not see yet because of those things that we have already seen. We, we wait for, uh, for the God who um, has redeemed us through his death upon the cross and his resurrection from the dead to give us that own, uh, our own resurrection. In the same way, that is, as uh, Israel is getting ready to die, he, he waits for the salvation of the Lord because he knows, uh, based on that which was given to, to his father Abraham, the promise, um, that that, uh, that way, even when you're squinting through prophecy, you're looking to the same Jesus. So we'll, we'll call it here uh, for the day. We'll pick up and, and carry forward. Uh, we're going to finish the book of Genesis this week. Uh, I, I know that one was a little bit slow, but there's, there's so much cool stuff in that one verse that uh, I wanted to talk about that instead of the stuff I didn't understand. So uh, thanks so much. Uh, again, I'm Pastor Goodman filling in for Pastor Borkart. Please keep him and his family in your prayers. Uh, they, uh, they rejoice in the Lord's mercy and wait for his salvation even now. Um, the Lord bless you and keep you all. Have a great day. Bye.